Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Tim Wright. I'm co-founder of the research and consultancy firm Twin Tangibles. And we're going to talk this morning about a subject that's uh, grain, gaining increasing attention these days, and that's the subject of crowdfunding. Uh, crowdfunding is getting increasing attention for a number of reasons, not least because crowdfunding represents an alternative mechanism of raising capital or funds. And at times when these processes can become challenging and difficult and constrained, examining all of the options that are available to you is a sensible course of action, and crowdfunding is becoming uh, interesting because of that. But it's also uh, increasingly uh, a subject of debate because of its close relationship with social media and the gathering awareness and use of social media, particularly in a business context, means that uh, crowdfunding is an area that people want to examine in a little bit more detail. So let's begin with a quick definition of what crowdfunding actually is. Uh, the collective cooperation, attention and trust by people who network and pool their money and other resources together usually via the internet to support efforts initiated by other people or organizations. So in essence, what we're talking about is an organization or group or a person coming forward with a plan, a project that they wish to fund or resource in some way, and then looking at a group of people coming together to actually provide the funding and resources and support to actually deliver that particular project. Now, it has some distinctions from what you would probably refer to as traditional fundraising, and we'll look at those as we, we go through these things. One of the concepts that it's important to understand in the context of crowdfunding, and indeed uh, something that's important in a lot of the, the ways that the internet is changing things for us, is the concept of the long tail. And a lot of our standard frameworks and a lot of our commonly held understandings of how things operate we use an 80-20 or Pareto distribution. It, within that, if we look at, for example, the, the, uh, the case of perhaps a retailer. The retailer will carry a stock, a portfolio of products that they will expect to sell in multiple numbers in order to deliver their revenue streams. So they constrain the product set to those that they feel are the most popular to their target market. In the long tail theory, as transactional costs come down and as the, the resistance or friction that prevents transactions being straightforward is reduced, there's an opportunity to look at a different model. And that model is to look at an aggregated model where a larger portfolio is, is made available to uh, the purchasers. And when you aggregate together individual, small, occasional transactions across a larger portfolio, it's as large as the other distribution and it becomes a sustainable model. And one of the things about the internet is that it allows us to actually reduce those transactional costs and make available that wider portfolio. And this is something that is key to the success of organizations such as Amazon. The same principle applies within the crowdfunding scenario. What you're looking to achieve is a large number of small donations being aggregated together to produce a significant sum. So it's the idea of introducing the, the idea and proposal of people uh, contributing to a cause to a larger audience. So key to actually achieving that and why there is a strong connection here to the idea of social media is, the, is how social media can extend the reach of your proposition. In the social media model, you can reach out to your initial community, and the expectation is that you are looking for that community to reach out to theirs, and theirs to the, the next community. And ultimately, you have a viral type distribution, which means that your reach is significantly extended. It's tied into the idea of uh, uh, six degrees of separation. Now, for crowdfunding projects to be successful, you need to be aware of this and plan your project accordingly to take advantage of that viral distribution to reach out to the largest possible crowd. So if, if we were to simplify the crowdfunding models, there are typically three types of models that we would be dealing with. Uh, this is a slight oversimplification, but for the purposes of this seminar, it works well enough. Reward-based crowdfunding is a mechanism where 
um, people who are making a contribution, a financial contribution in this instance, uh, are rewarded in some way. Now, those rewards can be tangible or intangible, but there is a return for the investment that's being made. Increasingly, we're seeing equity-based crowdfunding. So this is in the, in the commercial sector where organizations are actually selling uh, sections of their equity uh, in return for small purchases um, from that, uh, of that equity base. Now, this is more popular within the UK and Europe because legislatively it's more permissible. There, there are less hurdles to be got over. But it's becoming increasingly popular and we're aware of the fact that in the United States there are proposed changes to SEC regulations to actually make this process um, easier. Uh, and to permit it within, within the, the bounds of the US. And this is clearly recognizing that as a mechanism to democratize investment, but also to find new funding for entrepreneurial development, uh, this is an important uh, lever to be used. So there's an increasing awareness in lots of different geographies that this may be an alternative new and, and potentially very powerful mechanism of raising funds that has not previously been made available. The other uh, model that we can look at as being under the umbrella of crowdfunding is the microfinance lending. This is where uh, contributions are aggregated together into a pot of money, which is then lent on to third parties uh, who will pay that money back. It is a loan and there is a return. Now this again is, is something that is gaining uh, interest and, and credence, not least because or when people are looking for alternative mechanisms of uh, seeing a return on their capital. This is quite a, a powerful one. It does uh, tend to make uh, solid, safe, and regular returns because this is a microfinance-based uh, initiative. This is not significantly large loans over extended periods. This is a quick transactional uh, aspect to this. Uh, typically, we find microfinance uh, lending and peer-to-peer -peer lending uh, often has some kind of ethical aspect to it. It has uh, typically origins within the uh, microfinance initiatives of people like Muhammad Yunus and the Grameen Bank. Um, but it's not exclusively so. It is also, you see, lending uh, to quite uh, standard lending terms, so it's not necessarily uh, bounded by ethical concerns entirely. For the purposes of this morning, we're going to focus mainly on the first two. And within that, we can find two further flavors of, of uh, crowdfunding. Uh, what was commonly referred to as the all or nothing model, uh, where a project has a specific financial target that it sets and intends to reach. If it does not reach that target, the, uh, the project host, the project initiators do not receive the funding, nor do the rewarders or the lenders or the investors receive their rewards. Um, the keep it all model uh, is where whatever is raised in the course of the crowdfunding campaign is kept by the crowdfunding host and those people that do procure rewards do receive their rewards. So they're two quite different models. The all or nothing model is, a, is in some ways a more compelling model in that it sets up what's commonly referred to as a burning platform. So there's an imperative for you to actually deliver on the project. And importantly, what it seems to achieve is that those people who have procured a reward before the, the project target is met have an, have an investment in and, and an interest in making sure that the project is a success. So they will become the advocates, they will become the ambassadors for the project and so have an extra incentive to reach out to their community to find other people to invest in the project. And so that is a way of clearly tapping into this idea of the, the viral aspect of, of uh, social media communications. So let's just recap on some of the key characteristics that, that we find in uh, crowdfunding. Typically, this is microfinance. So by having small contributions, uh, small investments, we are lowering the barrier for people to participate. So people who perhaps never thought of themselves as investors before can now think of themselves as investors because the barrier to entry has been lowered. And of course, this is key to opening up into the, the long tail because it brings into play a larger group, a larger tribe, a larger crowd to actually make the process a success. Rewards, rewards is 
typically part of this. Uh, sometimes they are uh, intangible rewards. They may be association, feel good, a whole range of things. Uh, but these rewards are there and they need to be emphasized and recognized. Uh, but a diversity of reward can be in there, uh, again, as a mechanism of trying to make sure that you open this out and make it attractive to the largest possible group of people. Targets, there's usually a very defined target, a sum of money that people are actually uh, seeking to achieve uh, to a particular end. Typically, the projects are time limited. Not always so, but typically they are. Again, we would generally recommend that, that you impose some kind of time limit around this, again, to give yourself an imperative as the project delivers, but also to, to remind those people that, that may be thinking of investing that there is a point beyond which they will not be able to do it, so encouraging them to do it. Viral promotion, this is, this is uh, very much part of the way the, the, uh, the projects will work and the onus is very much on you as the project host to make sure that you are promoting this, this project through to completion. It won't just happen by itself. Project-based, uh, again, typically crowdfunding projects are around a specific project, delivering a project, and rarely are they aimed at raising funds for just operating and ongoing costs. Where is it used? It's used uh, in many, many different areas. As we've already mentioned, we're now seeing this, this uh, creeping into uh, entrepreneurial work, uh, particularly with, with the advance of, of equity funding. But charities, creatives are, are increasingly making use of it as funding for arts-based projects seems to be more constrained, particularly in the UK. And uh, uh, we see it as a, also being used for campaigning uh, purposes. But a very, very wide area some interesting niche uh, crowdfunding platforms emerging, like, for example, Unbound, that is particularly aimed at the, the publishing arena. Have a look at a, a couple of, of examples, just to give you a flavor for some of the more high-profile examples of crowdfunding that you may have come across. The Obama presidential campaign fundraising uh, process is often referred to as a, as a crowdfunding example and a good crowdfunding example. And typically people focus on the fact that the sheer sum of money that was raised by the Obama team is, was significantly larger than, than anything that had been raised in the past. So here we see $264.5 million raised by the Obama campaign against $88.2 million by his opponent, John McCain. And now that, that is true. The actual sums are, are impressive. And given that, that Obama's campaign didn't use many of the traditional mechanisms that, that are, are commonly used in presidential campaigns, so fundraising exercises, dinners, and, and, and such like. Uh, and Obama relied a great deal on the use of, of social media techniques to find funders. One of the more interesting aspects of it, and sometimes overlooked, is how the proportion of that sum is made up of contributions of less than $200. So bear in mind we're talking about the idea of crowdfunding being the aggregation together of a lot of smaller contributions. And we can see when we look at the proportion on the Obama campaign that uh, his campaign clearly proportionally had a significant more, a number of more uh, contributions of less than $200. So again, bringing people into the process who perhaps were previously um, felt excluded from this process. And in, in, a, uh, in a political context here, of course, one of the uh, outcomes of this uh, is that typically people that do actually invest will both become ambassadors but will also turn out and vote. And uh, this seems to have been the case in the Obama campaign that the demographic, particularly of young uh, uh, cohorts who are, are involved with social media, did turn out and vote more than in, in previous elections. So it's an interesting uh, uh, comparison and, and an extra twist on the, the crowdfunding campaign that Obama used. So another example, this is particularly a Scottish-based uh, example, is BrewDog, who uh, were a microbrewery, but I'm not sure we can call them a microbrewery anymore. Uh, they have, were, were one of the first companies in Europe to try and raise money uh, through an online share offering. And this was based on the fact that they have an extremely strong social media presence and they are using that asset uh, to, to great effect. Uh, they've gone through two rounds. The first round uh, was 10% of the firm's equity, £230 per share. 
not a complete success in as much as they didn't reach the target that they ultimately uh, had set out for themselves, but they still raised a significant amount of money and set a benchmark um, of what is possible within this, this uh, arena. Uh, they obviously learned from that, that experience, uh, built on it, uh, and clearly the investing community understood the proposition more clearly after the first round. And the second round, which is a more recent one, uh, was significantly more successful, indeed raising a million pounds in less than, than, than two weeks. So here we've got a classic example of, of a proper uh, investment, equity-based investment, using the crowdfunding model and delivering a significant investment for, for the brewery that allows it to take its, its business plan on. What is interesting particularly about that investment is that it's a very stable investment. It's a lot of smaller investors, it's a very democratic investment, and typically because of the way they've drawn on their, their social media community, there's a, a considerable amount of, of a brand loyalty associated with the reason in purchasing some of that equity. And so it's very stable and the expectation of return is very different from some of the investment models. So less aggressive than many of the, the uh, VC uh, based or uh, private equity based investments. Uh, indeed one of the, the key benefits to, to actually purchasing uh, some equity in, in the, the Brewdog uh, brewery was that you got 20% off in the shop. Now I'm not sure if you'd gone to a traditional venture capitalist and asked for a million pounds and offered him 20% off in the shop, you'd have got your million pounds. So it's, a, it's an interesting uh, example that highlights that uh, in an equity-based crowdfunding model there are some significant benefits over and above the idea that you're finding an alternative uh, a route to finding your investment. Now, neither Obama or BrewDog used any of the commonly used uh, crowdfunding platforms which we're going to look at in a little while. The final example we're going to have a quick look at is the TikTok lunatic example which used one of the more popular crowdfunding platforms, that of Kickstarter. In this case, this is, this is a, a, obviously US-based um, and a, not an equity-based one. In this case, we had an entrepreneur that had developed a product idea which was essentially a strap that allowed you to carry an iPod Nano around and uh, in the form of, if you will, a, a wristwatch. And so have both a watch and all of the functionality of your iPod Nano to hand. What they did was ran a crowdfunding campaign through Kickstarter to raise $15,000 was their goal in order to take that product to market. Clearly, uh, they, they were successful. They had six reward categories. Most of those rewards, if not all of them, were very much closely related to uh, making the product available in one way or another. So premium uh, products, uh, products ahead of the availability to market, products with extras but essentially product-based. So what they were looking at typically was uh, people pre-ordering a product. But again, uh, still a valid model. Uh, average donation of $70 from 13,500 investors returned $941,000. So getting on for a million dollars from a goal of 15,000. Now this is an exceptional case, but again, it does demonstrate the, the, the possible. Uh, and it's not an isolated case. So that begs the question of why would you use one of the crowdsourcing platforms? Not everybody does, but why, why is it uh, sensible for you to make use of these, these platforms? Well, they're turnkey solutions. They have all of the functionality that you, you will need in order to carry through your campaign. So it actually means that one of the key uh, propositions from these platforms is it reduces the transactional cost. And if we refer back to the long tail model, that is one of the things we're intending to achieve because that allows us to tap into that, that, that long chain, that long tail in an economically sensible way. It's also a meeting place for investors and donors. So the people that come to these sites are typically those that are already looking to invest or make donations and get involved with these kind of projects. So you're, you're already putting your project in with a pool of other people in front of uh, a, a ready and active uh, crowd or audience, if you will, who are looking to actually get engaged. So have an inbuilt community as well. If we look at the behaviors of investors on some of the, the platforms like Kickstarter and others, typically those people are involved in more than one project. They're not doing a single investment. 
uh, the transactional cost we've referred to, social media integrated. On, in most cases, you'll find these platforms have strong connectivity and strong integration with the, with the common social media tools. That means that you can run a social media-based campaign through this platform relatively uh, straightforwardly and reduces legislative complexity. Um, I guess that applies to all of the standard transactions, but it also is an important factor, particularly if you're going down an equity-based route. There are, there are checks and balances and steps that you would have to go through in order to uh, be accepted onto the platform, and so it does ensure that you are uh, going through most of the correct legislative steps. However, the diversity of platform is enormous. This is a tiny selection of many, many um, platforms and new platforms coming on board every day, uh, all offering slightly different things. And they all differentiate themselves in slightly different ways. And consequently, as a group that are interested in setting up crowdfunding projects, you need to choose your platform quite carefully. You can see here that there are, there are varieties in terms of geography, in terms of the fees that they charge, whether equity is part of that, um, the sector that they're aimed at. So some of the key characteristics they use to differentiate themselves and appeal to their audiences are their sectoral specific. Some aim at specific creative sectors, for example. Uh, some are community-based. Some have geographical limitations, so you can't put a project on there if you're not within the geography or you can't invest in the, in the projects if you are not within that geography. Some emphasize the weight of traffic that is coming to their site, so the implication is that the, the, uh, they're increasing the, the likelihood of a serendipitous discovery of your project and therefore um, more investors. There are sometimes constraints around the size of contributions that can be made. Um, the, the fee payments and fee structures vary quite, quite markedly across the platforms and some are more attractive than others depending on the nature of the project that you're trying to do. And some are quite strict around time limits, uh, others less so. So there's, there's a significant mix and any crowdfunding project initiator needs to choose quite carefully uh, which platform that they are wanting to use. So what's a typical process um, that you would go through as a seller or as somebody that's running a, a crowdfunding project. Typically, you're going to decide on your project and the target that you want to achieve. Uh, you will decide on the rewards and the nature of the rewards that you're going to, to put on offer and the duration of the project. As I've said, I would encourage anybody to make sure that they put build in a time limit, even whether it's stated or not publicly, but give themselves the imperative to drive this through. And in terms of the rewards, a diversity of reward uh, is, is uh, important and useful. You need to be quite creative about that sometimes. You would then think about the platform that you want to use and the, the tools, particularly the social media tools that you wish to employ to actually do the outreach to your potential investors. And that is a, a slightly more complex uh, decision than some people perhaps think. You target your initial group that you're going to um, uh, communicate with to make them aware of the fact that your project is live launch it, and then promote, promote, promote. I can't emphasize enough that it, it will be your responsibility as the crowdfunding project manager to make this happen. It's a rather uh, a, a not uncommon for uh, organizations to put a project onto a crowdfunding platform and believe that that's it, almost as if that they put something on eBay, it will almost sell itself doesn't happen. You have to carry this through. The platform is essentially the transactional mechanism that you've got. The responsibility on you is to promote it and, uh, and make use of all of the uh, tools and opportunities you've got to make it a success. Of course, the, the, the platform that you choose will have a, a role to play in that, but the emphasis is essentially on you. If we assume uh, that uh, we reach our target, if it's a all or nothing model, uh, we will collect our funds. Of course, if it's a keep it all, we will collect our funds uh, regardless of whether we reach our target or not. So thinking about the process from the other side as a purchaser or investor, uh, you select your project. You can either do that because you're browsing, looking for the projects uh, proactively, or you're approached or made aware of the fact that there's a project that you're interested in um, getting involved in. You purchase your reward. Again, those rewards can be tangible or intangible. 
Ideally, what the project host would want you to do is then promote the project so that you become part of the team to deliver it. Assuming the target's met in an, in an all or nothing model, then you will collect your reward. Of course, in a keep it all model, you would get your reward um, anyway. So let's have a look at some of the key numbers. Uh, there are lots that we could choose from, but let's just have a quick look at Kickstarter, one of the, the, the uh, most longest established of, of the crowdfunding platforms. It would suggest that about 44% of the initiatives are successfully funded. So less than half are successful. Uh, don't be under the impression that crowdfunding, by setting up a crowdfunding project, you are necessarily going to succeed. Only 44% are successful. However, that's a significant number. And in the two and a half years after Kickstarter's launch, million people helped to back over 10,000 successful projects. So uh, there are lots of good success stories out there. Uh, 75,000 new backers, that's new backers, pledge to the project each month. So there's a clear growth pattern here. It's becoming more popular from both sides, from those people that are lo looking to launch projects, but also those people that are looking to invest in them. Kiva, which is one of the uh, micro-lending um, uh, uh, groups and, and commonly uh, referred to in this context, they've collected $260 million for worldwide projects. Most of their, their uh, lending is to uh, the developing world. Uh, 670,000 entrepreneurs have received loans. Now, one of the interesting statistics is the repayment rate. This is a repayment rate that most of the high street banks and lenders would kill for. And it it's, um, emphasizes one of the points that we've, we've referred to already, the idea that investing through this model is actually a very safe model in terms of making sure that you will actually get your, your capital back. And parts of the reasons for that are the nature of the lending, their microfinances, they're not, not uh, long duration. But this also, again, if we look at, for example, the Grameen Bank and the mechanisms that that has for risk assessment and guarantors, these are, these are uh, uh, tremendously trust-based, and uh, it, it's, a, it's an interesting and successful model, something that perhaps the banks could, could learn from. So, keys to success. So if you're looking to run a crowdfunding campaign, so to close out, I would offer these, these uh, suggestions for you to help make sure that your, your uh, campaign is more likely to succeed. Be social media ready. Um, it never ceases to amaze me uh, that you come across crowdfunding projects for people that have absolutely no social media presence and practically no understanding of how that environment works. We would suggest that social media is a key component of a successful uh, social uh, crowdfunding project. And if you don't have some social media collateral to draw on, some awareness of it, some asset there, then we would suggest that you postpone launching your campaign until you have. Have a strategy, you need a plan. This does take planning. It's not something that you can just fly by the seat of your pants on. Select your project carefully. Be realistic, make it achievable. A successful project, a small project successful is better than a large project that fails. Uh, it will build your credibility, it will build your confidence, it will allow you to move on to a further project. So think about what it is. And you also need to think about the subject matter, what it is that you're actually running the project for, because that'll help you create your pitch, which we'll refer to in a second. Do try and identify an initial target audience. Bear in mind that what you're going to try and do is make that target audience reach out to their uh, audience. So uh, be, uh, spend some time thinking about it and understanding it. Where do they go? What if they're going to use social media tools? Which, which tools does that audience typically use? Select your platform carefully. We've already highlighted the fact that platforms are very, very diverse. There's a whole range of uh, different options to choose from. So find the one that works for you. Create your pitch. This is absolutely key. The, the pitch that you come up with for your project has to be engaging. It has to have some passion. We would recommend that you produce a video. It doesn't need to be Titanic, uh, but a video uh, can, can capture and convey uh, a whole range of very, very powerful messages in a very quick and easy way. And in, in a highly visual world that we live in, uh, it's, it's an effective way of communicating with your, your audience. If you do not put, you don't have a, any passion in your story, you don't have a story to tell, 
why do you think anybody is going to bother to invest in your project? This is a key element of what you need to do. Select the channels that you're going to use. These are the social media channels and communication channels that you're going to use. They do vary uh, in terms of their reach and their application, so make sure that you're using the right ones for the purposes that you're, you're setting out to achieve. And also be aware of the fact that the more you choose, the more resources it's going to draw on for you to actually deliver this. So we would suggest developing a publishing plan. You will need to have material to keep this project alive and keep it uh, interesting throughout its duration. Of course, there'll be material that develops through the course of the project as you're responding to investors and uh, uh, telling the story progressively as, as the project unfolds. But don't be under any illusions that you will need material to keep this alive. And uh, coming up with a publishing plan that uh, sets this out and has some idea of what the story is that you're going to tell through the course of the project uh, is a sensible course of action so that you're prepared. Set yourself a time frame. Again, we've used the expression burning platform. Uh, I think it's important that you do give yourself some kind of imperative, some notion where you're going to have some, either some staging points through the course of the project or a particular close date. You need to have that imperative for your own sense, for your own ability to deliver it, but also to, to act as an imperative for those people that are going to get involved. Engage. Again, I'm emphasizing this fact that it's your responsibility to make this project succeed. The crowdfunding platform will not make it happen for you. You have to deliver it. Giving your funders access to privileged information is quite a, a, a nice way of helping to bind them in, but also then encouraging them to share that, that material. So again, emphasizing this need for getting your, your initial investors to uh, reach out to their community to find, find more people. So the sense of belonging, the sense of engagement is, is quite key. Promote, again, don't assume that people know about it. Don't assume that people will necessarily find your project just because it happens to be on one of the popular platforms. The popular platforms have new projects launching every single day. So promote yours and make sure that it's got high visibility. And this may seem a very obvious thing, but honor your promises. If you make promises to people, honor them, because if you don't, this will be the first and last crowdfunding project you will ever achieve. If you honor your promises and are seen as a, a, an honorable crowdfunding project originator, you may well be able to move on to further crowdfunding projects for more um, uh, initiatives that you have in the future. Those are our keys to success that we would recommend you make use of uh, in the course of your crowdfunding campaign. That kind of brings us to the end of the presentation this morning. I hope it's been useful to you and I wish you every success in your crowdfunding campaign.